working group of, on the use of mercenaries who are joining us on the virtual room today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's 1.31 p.m. here in Geneva, so let us get us started. My name is Carolina Hernandez. I am the advisor on migration and human rights at the Office for Human Rights, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And it is really my pleasure to open and moderate this online panel discussion that is co-hosted by the Working Group on the Use of Mercenaries and by Privacy International. And as uh, many of you know, this is organized on the margins of the 45th session of the Human Rights Council, during which the Working Group has presented its most recent report on the impact of the use of private military and security services in immigration and border management on the protection of the rights of all migrants. And just let me start by congratulating the working group on an incredibly powerful report, which makes an important, a very important contribution to the field of migration and human rights in an area that is often obscured from public oversight, human rights monitoring and accountability. As the report finds in recent years, particularly in the last two decades, there has been a marked increase in the use of private military and security services in the field of migration which is often linked to the many ways in which migration is uh, increasingly securitized, that is viewed primarily through the lens of national security, as well as the specific measures taken to externalize borders by working with origin and transit states to curtail irregular migration. In the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights, many monitoring missions on migration in various countries in different regions, we have noted with concern that border governance measures based on these approaches, that is the securitization of migration and the externalization of border controls often cause or exacerbate the risk of human rights abuses. And noting the increased use of private military and security services, the office has recommended uh, that governments ensure effective oversight, monitoring and accountability of private actors carrying out migration governance functions. And there I, I point you to, to the offices recommended principles and guidelines on human rights at international borders. The Global Compact for Migration also uh, is a, a roadmap in which member states have made a number of important commitments that are equally important for member states as well as private military and security companies involved in border governance uh, and migration governance issues more broadly. Some of these include upholding the right to privacy, the collection, the analysis, the dissemination of personal data, reducing vulnerabilities in migration, saving lives and preventing migrants' deaths and injuries, managing borders in a way that respects the human rights of all migrants, prioritizing non-custodial alternatives to detention and using detention only as a measure of last resort, and ensuring that all returns, whether they're forced or voluntary are safe and dignified and uphold the right to due process, the prohibition of collective expulsions, and the principle of non -reform. So the working group report highlights a range of concerning practices and technologies, including as regard private immigration detention, taking of personal biometric information, airline car exemptions, the use of drones and other land, air, and sea monitoring technologies. But it also points to many of the other ways in which private military and security companies are actually influencing laws, policies, and even our public discourse around migration, which is too often, as we know, frame, as, frame migration more as a threat to be mitigated rather than a human phenomenon to be governed, placing migrants at the center. And as we will hear today, these efforts have profound impacts on the human rights of migrants, particularly those that are in the vulnerable situations and have fewer options for safe and regular migration. So with this, I will uh, be inviting the chair of Portor, the working group of the use of mercenaries to share with us uh, some of the report findings and recommendations. And I would subsequently give the floor to all of our distinguished speakers. But before that, let me just give you um, a few uh, housekeeping instructions. We have six panels, uh, panelists today with us. So to provide enough time, for questions and answers, we have invited the speakers to limit their interventions to eight, seven, seven, eight, um, maximum 10 minutes, and I will be reminding them when the clock hits seven minutes. For the Q&A session, for the questions and answers, I would invite all the participants joining us today to please share their questions in the chat box, but also to use the raise 
your hand function that we have in this platform to intervene after the speakers ask questions. Um, we will have first a set of three speakers giving a very brief uh, session for Q&A, then go to the three other uh, speakers on the panel today and have another session for Q&A, for questions and answers. And I just wanted to finally note that the webinar today will be recorded and we will make it available on YouTube later today or at the latest tomorrow. So with this, I would just like to uh, kindly invite the chair rapporteur of the working group on the use of mercenaries to speak. Mr. Kwaja, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Carolina. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, on behalf of the working group on the use of mercenaries, I want to thank all our distinguished panelists, the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants, Privacy International, the Deputy General Counsel of the Australian Human Rights Commission, Transnational Institute and renowned experts as well as participants, including representatives of state and civil society for joining us today. It is a great pleasure to see that so many of you are joining from all over the world, early in the morning and late in the evening for this panel discussion. I want to say thank you for that uh, opportunity. I would particularly like to thank Privacy International for co-hosting this event, allowing us to jointly examine the human rights impact of the use of private military and security services in immigration detention and border management. As you are all aware, this event builds on several panels and discussions that the working group organized over the past few years that led to the report we presented to the Human Rights Council earlier in December of this year. We are happy to present and discuss our findings, and in particular, we wish to explore ways to move forward and to address some of the important challenges identified in the report that we presented to the Human Rights Council. Over the years, the working group has consistently raised awareness and expressed deep concerns about the human rights impact of the provision of human rights, of, 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 for the provision of private military and security services on the human rights of all migrants. Uh, this year, the thematic report of the working group highlighted significant negative consequences associated with uh, the provision of such services in terms of the protection of the, of the rights of all migrants caused by the increased and wide ranging use of private military and security services to support state policies on immigration, detention, and border management. Colleagues, uh, today, immigration, detention, and border management has become a multi-billion dollar business with global security, border security identified as an important market for, 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 for further growth in the coming years. This surge in, in immigration detention and border management represents a vivid example of the extent to which the core security functions of states are increasingly being privatized uh, on the global scale. In the absence of a universal, universal definition, a legal definition for the ease of reference, the working group used the term migrants to refer to all persons who are outside the state of which they are a citizen or national or their habitual residence or in the cases of stateless persons, their state of birth or habitual residence. The term includes migrants who intend to move permanently or temporarily and those who move in a, in a regular or documented manner, as well as migrants irregular or as well as migrants in irregular situations. It also encompasses different categories of persons, such as asylum seekers, refugees, and migrant workers. The involvement of private military and security companies in immigration, detention, and border control is part of a broader process of outsourcing inherent state functions to private, to the private sector or private actors across all spheres of governance. This is direct consequence of the rise of protectionism across the developed and the, the developed world and nationalist discourse that portrays migration as a security threat and does not perceive migrants as a vulnerable population in need of protection. In such context, state delegates a great the, the state delegates a great deal of security management to private actors who have the technological and human capacity to respond to operations designed by the state. This business relationship creates much confusion 
about the obligations and the responsibilities of each actor and often create a protection gap with states and private military and security companies operating in almost total impunity. Among the wide ranges of services PMFCs are involved in, we focus on the following activities because of their immediate and grave impact on migrants' rights. One is the provision of research and technical expertise. Two, border security technologies and monitoring services. Three, procedure and conditions of immigration detention, returns and removals. And lastly, implementation of externalization policies. In many cases, companies were found directly responsible for human rights abuses of migrants, including refugees and asylum seekers, notably in situations of deprivation of liberty. In other cases, they were complicit in human rights violation and abuse caused by other actors such as state immigration and border authorities. In light of the increasing reports of violation and abuses of the rights of migrants, the working group calls for a fundamental reassessment of migration regulation and management. In particular, privatization and securitization practices must be effectively assessed to ensure they do not take precedence over human rights and humanitarian principles and subsequently widen the protection gaps. Ultimately, it is the states that have duty to protect, promote, and fulfill the human rights of all migrants within their jurisdiction or effective control, including extra extraterritoriality. Uh, yeah. Where applicable, these obligations remain regardless of whether states have outsourced certain immigration detention and border control functions to a private sector. States must take urgent measures to fulfill these obligations, including by strengthening the legal and regulatory framework, frameworks applicable to private military and security services. It is the view of the working group that particular attention must be paid to companies whom they have contracted inherent state functions, such as immigration detention and border management, as well as companies whose activities take place in environments with an increased risk of serious human rights violations and abuses. States should also put in place or reinforce administrative regulation of public procurement, licensing and authorization, and align them with their human rights obligations because we believe that it is the responsibility of states to take their human rights obligations very strongly and seriously. In the report, we also reiterate our call on states and all stakeholders involved to terminate the practice of outsourcing the overall operation of immigration detention facilities to private military and security companies. Detention should be limited to exceptional circumstances and with the unique purpose of verifying the identity of the migrant who should be released soon after in accordance with relevant international standards. States should also undertake regular and comprehensive reviews of advanced technologies purchased from and maintained by companies for immigration and border management purposes in order to assess their human rights compliance. They should also publicly disclose detailed and appropriate levels of information on immigration detention and border control functions outsourced to business entities and strengthen national level oversight mechanisms. Regarding the collection, storage, and use of biometric and other data on, mig on migrants, states must require companies to ensure that the system they provide and, they and manage are regulated by law and comply with international standards and best practices on data protection and privacy. With respect to the companies operating in this sector, they must comply with domestic leg legislation and they must exercise human rights due diligence to avoid causing, contributing, or becoming directly linked to adverse human rights impact. We urge companies to be more transparent by publicly disclosing accessible, clear, and non-ambiguous information with regard to their contracts and operations as well as adverse human rights impact caused by their operations where they operate. They should also provide or cooperate with legitimate processes to remedy violations and abuses, including cooperating with judicial mechanisms where appropriate. Let me conclude by thanking you on behalf of all members of the working group for joining us today and for taking interest in all our reports on such an important topic. I look forward to hearing the observations and insights of our panelists and I look forward to any future discussion regarding the work 
of the working group on machineries. Once more, thank you very much for this opportunity and for participating in this panel event. I wish us all fruitful deliberation. Thank you. Thanks to you, Mr. Quadra, Chair Rapporteur, and, and thanks to all the working group members for this very important report that, as I mentioned, is uh, really informing an area that needed uh, much more of these key findings and recommendations, uh, some of which you have outlined uh, during your intervention. Thank you for that. And we hope to be able to go in, in more depth in, in the discussion on, on some of those recommendations. And with that, um, I would invite uh, Dr. Ilya Siatitsa, who's the Program Director of Privacy International, uh, co-hosting this event today, who will be speaking about the role of private military and security companies in aspects relating to data gathering and the absence of adequate privacy safeguards. Um, uh, Dr. Siatitsa, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, well, first, let me start by thanking the UN Working Group for convening this meeting. And on behalf of Privacy International, we are very happy we had the opportunity to co-host this discussion here today. Privacy International, or otherwise PI, uh, is a London-based non-governmental organization that works globally at the intersection of modern technologies and human rights. We have welcomed and supported the working group's call and subsequent reports we are discussing here today. As these issues are particularly relevant to us, uh, we have for a while now been monitoring the essential role co companies play in the process of migration and border management. Over the past years, uh, there has been a gradual move towards the data fiction of border management. Uh, with every new technology introduced, more data is collected and new types of data processing aimed at tracking and identifying migrants are introduced, all with the assistance of private actors. What we have observed, and the UN Working Group's report also highlights, is that these new data-driven border control technologies are not only introduced without transparency, but they are also introduced without appropriate legal frameworks in place that can protect the rights to privacy and data protection, are introduced more often than not without any data protection impact assessments or human rights risk assessments, and are introduced without appropriate remedial procedures, while they become a key in determining who enters in a country or not, who stays and who leaves, who can travel and who cannot. In the next couple of minutes, I will just refer to some examples demonstrating some uh, of the above. So regarding the lack of appropriate legal frameworks, one can look along, among others at the various identification and biometrics databases that are built at many countries around the world at the moment. And these are part of the migration management strategies. In the last few years, border externalization, which is describes the transfer of border, border control to foreign countries, has become the main instrument through which the EU, the US and others seek to stop migratory flows towards them. As part of these policies, they finance identification systems in third countries that collect fingerprints, iris scans or face data. Companies are playing an essential role in the process. Um, one of these companies is Civipool, which fun fact, is partly owned by large arm, arms producers, companies. In December 2016, Civipol was chosen to set up and deploy databases to fingerprint everyone in Mali and Senegal. Going beyond fingerprinting, it is also involved in building full biometric ID system in Senegal and Côte d'Ivoire. These projects are financed by the EU, EU Emergency Trust Fund for Africa. Their primary aim is to be able to identify irregular migrants from these countries who may be in Europe and then deport them. Whether this is good enough reason to collect an entire country's data, I'll leave it to you to decide. Uh, but irrespective of whether it is, I want to highlight that already many of these countries do not necessarily have the legal frameworks that will ensure the respect of the rights to privacy and data protection. And as a result, they are to be able to secure that this data will not be used for other than the intended purposes or to regulate 
third party access to this information. Second, data driven technologies are further introduced to process visa and pre departure screening at airports and other points of departure. But they more often than not are introduced without appropriate data protection impact assessment or human rights risk assessment. One such example um, relates to the use of social media, media intelligent technologies. This uh, describes techniques and technologies that allow um, companies or governments to monitor social media platforms such as Facebook or Twitter. So for instance, in the September 2000, uh, last year, Frontex, the European Border and Coast Guard Agency, published a call for tender to pay 400,000 euros to a surveillance company to track people on social media so that border guards would have, among others, an understanding of the current landscape. The plan was to gather data of traffickers, smugglers, migrants, but also civil society and diaspora communities. Following this announcement, PI set up an account on the procurement website and asked them detailed questions to find out if they had gone through the necessary checks as required by EU law binding Frontex. Instead of answering the questions, they simply canceled the tender process. But this is not the only case where plans are hastily made and as hastily withdrawn the moment questions around due diligence and rule of law arise. There is an EU funded project aiming at developing of, of a virtual police officer designed to subjecting travelers to lie detector tests before they are allowed to pass through customs. Highly unstable experimental technology known as eye border control we uh, they've never released any access to their results or any of the amend assessment made before um, testing it. Consider yet that their original goal was to run pilots using real volunteers in real border crossing points. However, thanks to concerted efforts among others by civil society, the developers were pressured not to run pilots with real volunteers in real border crossing. What is more, these new border control technologies are rolled out and tested in particularly precarious situations against groups of people in vulnerable positions, whether asylum seekers, refugees, or people on the moon, with hardly any remedial procedures in place. For instance, private companies are increasingly used in screening and determining and or determining of asylum or other claims for protection. One of the techniques used is the extraction of information from asylum seekers' smartphones. One of the companies providing such tools is Celebrite, traditionally used to extract data from the phones of people under criminal investigation. Celebrite is now marketing its digital extraction devices at authorities interrogating people seeking asylum. These companies' tools empower authorities to bypass passwords on digital devices, allowing them to download, analyze, and visualize data on them. Already, the use of such intrusive technologies raises many privacy concerns, including whether such intrusive practices are necessary or proportionate. But they are also introduced without providing mechanisms for those targeted to challenge their use or the information they collect. And they really need to. Uh, there is a belief and assumption that the data obtained obtained from digital devices leads to reliable evidence. But this assumption is flawed. If a person claims certain information is true and there exists information on their smartphone suggesting otherwise, it is not evidence necessarily that they are lying. They may have swapped phones and they may have been in touch with people whose name spelling appears on watch lists for a whole variety of reasons. What is more, the data processing during the extraction might actually not extract all data or there might be some other fault in the process. However, there are seldom any remedial procedures introduced in the asylum seeking process to be able to challenge these conclusions reached on the basis of what it is, to say the least, questionable evidence. To conclude, the rollout of such intrusive technologies does not only pose significant privacy and data protection threats, 
their deployment has serious implications for other rights as well. This is why privacy matters. Intrusions to privacy provides a gateway to the violation of other human rights, whether it's freedom of movement, right to seek asylum, or right to family reunification. In order to ensure that migrant rights is protected, it is imperative that any such processes comply with minimum privacy and data protection standards, including but not limited to robust legal framework, appropriate prior and during risk assessments and remedial procedures. Thank you very much for your attention and time, and I look forward to the further discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Siatitsa, and, and for pointing to those uh, key protection uh, gaps in terms of, of data protection, as well as lack of appropriate legal frameworks. And uh, I invite the, the, the participants to um, see the report of the working group. We have made the link available on the chat box, and it refers to some of these important elements, including uh, what Dr. Siatitsa was mentioning about the, the absence of um, adequate privacy safeguards. And with that, I will give the floor to the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants, Mr. Felipe Gonzalez Morales, uh, who will be reflecting on migration governance issues and will share with us some of his experiences from his contributions. Uh, um, Felipe, you have the floor. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, thank you to the Working Group on Mercenaries and Human Rights for this invitation. Um, I will try to, to put this. Uh, uh, the issues covered by the report in a broad context uh, uh, and, and um, make all, also reference to a number of uh, specific issues according to my experience as special rapporteur. Uh, first, I think this is a, a very timely and important report, uh, which uh, has a, an impact on a number of uh, issues related to uh, migration governance and on the human rights of migrants. I think that uh, in this regard, uh, the report uh, is, is very accurate and pertinent. Uh, putting the, the, the issue in a, in a broad context, I would like to stress the, um, the, the issue of the different approaches uh, toward migration. As, uh, as uh, you know, um, the security approach uh, has become uh, much stronger in recent, recent years. And there is always the uh, human rights-based approach that uh, uh, we at the, uh, at the Office of the Special Reporter are trying to enhance. Uh, this uh, discussion was also present during the preparation of the Global Compact on Migration, where these two uh, approaches uh, uh, came in place and, and were part of the discussion. Now, in this regard, I think one key question is uh, whether the uh, military and, uh, and private security, private military and private uh, security services that are hired by states uh, for migration issues have a human rights based uh, component. Um, that's the, the main question, I think. If they have this, this uh, human rights component uh, as part of their mandates, and in case of an affirmative answer, where this uh, human rights component is a relevant one or is a secondary one uh, after the security component. Let me be clear about this. From, from the point of view of the international human rights uh, treaties, security has a place, of course. Security can be invoked as a uh, legitimate uh, restriction uh, to some human rights but it cannot be applied to all the human rights for instance not to a right to life not to a right to physical or psychical integrity and not to a number of other human rights and in case of those human rights that can be legitimately restricted according to international law this does not imply that uh, they may uh, uh, dilute the, the presence of the human rights human rights must be the uh, main um, issue of protection and the security is a restriction that has to be uh, interpreted in a narrow manner so as not to uh, have a negative impact on human rights. On specific issues, uh, there is the issue of uh, migratory attention, um, including um, migratory 
detention of adults as a measure of last resort, uh, detention of uh, children on a, on, based on their migratory status as a, a prohibited measure. Uh, there was a strong discussion about this issue during the preparation of the Global Compact on Migration. In the end, the Global Compact establishes that uh, the states will work towards the end of uh, uh, migratory detention of children. I am uh, releasing a, a report about this matter that I'm going to present in a couple of weeks to a General Assembly of the UN. Um, this situation of migratory detention, of course, becomes much more acute in the current context of the pandemic. Uh, a number of, of states have um, released um, um, migrants, uh, but uh, this has not been the case in all countries at all. And in some countries, uh, you can see how uh, the tension of uh, migrants have been expanded, actually. Um, and there is the reference in the report about the um, Northwest Processing Center in the Washington state in, uh, in the United States, uh, which is a situation uh, very dramatic during the current pandemic. Uh, at which uh, my office uh, did a call to the, to the government of the United States to uh, substantially uh, reduce the level of uh, detainees there. And the Inter-American uh, Commission on Human Rights issued uh, precautionary measures uh, in favor of those uh, in detention. Regarding the externalization policies, there are a number of issues here. There is the issue of a due process and access to justice. There is the issue of the uh, right to seek asylum. There is the issue of the third safe country and uh, the principle of non-refoulement. In this regard, there are a number of modalities like the uh, off offshore uh, centers of uh, detention of asylum seekers and migrants, um, like the case of Australia, about which my office has uh, repeatedly stated that the uh, uh, conditions are not uh, uh, adequate for the protection of human rights. Otherwise, uh, there are uh, official agreements with uh, third countries, like in the case of, the, for instance, the United States with uh, Mexico and Central American countries. Although, uh, despite that these are official agreements, uh, it has been very difficult to get transparency about them and their contents. And also non-official agreements with third countries like the ones uh, that I uh, saw, for instance, in my visit to Niger uh, and the role that the European Union plays in, in this regard. On the issue of uh, returns, my office also uh, released a report about this matter a couple of years ago. Um, currently, there is an emphasis by many uh, countries of destination on the issue of uh, returns. Uh, and I think that this was uh, the, the main objective uh, of. Uh, of a number of them in, uh, during the negotiation of the Global Compact on Migration. There is, of course, the issue of uh, what uh, voluntary returns uh, mean. Um, for instance, when I was in my visit to Niger, I, could, uh, I interviewed many people who uh, were willing to sign uh, to return to their countries, but this was after a very long and terrible journey, many times where they have been subject to torture or or human rights, uh, great human rights abuses. So in the last step, they were uh, signed to go back to our countries. But this was in a, in a very irregular situation at which uh, there was uh, no alternative for them. There was no provision of uh, services if they decided to stay in Niger, for instance. So despite that, the, the, the fact that the European Union was uh, giving a lot of funding to Niger, this was being used uh, almost exclusively on, on, on security. Um, also, what we can see is that there is a, usually a very um, low consideration of uh, reintegration policies and measures, which should go along with these uh, uh, policies on, on return. Um, the issue of the access to information, oversight and monitoring of the, yes, uh, of the situation of, uh, of uh, migrants and uh, how, what is the practice of these uh, uh, private military and, and security services, I think is crucial. Um, and this has become more acute with the pandemic. In this regard, uh, states uh, have to conduct a, 
strong oversight of uh, the uh, private forces and uh, the right of the civil society to uh, monitor the situation has to be guaranteed as well. Finally, on the issue of accountability, uh, I think that the, the report by the working group is very clear about stating that uh, the state's obligations uh, remain. Uh, in this regard, the, the fact that the private uh, military or private security forces uh, security services are uh, operating does not diminish at all the role which has the obligation to oversight and has the obligation to prosecute and sanction those responsible for human rights abuses. In addition, these uh, uh, private uh, agents uh, may have uh, international responsibility as well. And uh, in a number of uh, cases, uh, uh, the UN uh, human rights bodies uh, have addressed both the states and uh, the private uh, uh, companies operating, like in the case, for instance, of that uh, detention center in Washington state in the US uh, for human rights abuses. So I'm open for a discussion with the public and the other panelists. And congratulations to the working group. Thank you very much. Mr. Reporter, thank you very much. Uh, very important reflections and that very important question about how we're really viewing, addressing and governing migration. If solely from a security approach or really from a more comprehensive approach that puts uh, places migrants at the center in, in the, the various, um, in the context of the various issues that you mentioned, immigration detention, returns, the broader governance uh, issues, and certainly the, the element of accountability that, as you say, is uh, clearly outlined in the working uh, report. So with that, I will uh, invite maybe to, to make this a little bit more dynamic. The participants, I see that we have over 70 participants joining, whether there is anyone that would like to raise the uh, uh, their hand to make any questions. We have this raise the hand function in, in this platform. And so I'm wondering if anyone is ready to ask a question. I don't see anything at the moment in the chat box. Otherwise, then I will invite you to prepare your questions, maybe write them in the chat box. Let us know if you would like to um, raise the hand and ask any questions. And maybe then I will uh, continue with our distinguished panelists and now give the, the floor to Mr. Graham Engerton. He's a Deputy General Counsel at the Australian Human Rights Commission. And he's also the author of the Commission's 2019 report on use of force in immigration detention that we can make available in the chat box in a few seconds, and who will be speaking about some of the findings outlined in this report, including on the impacts of the privatization of detention services. So with that, Mr. Edgar Tan, you have the floor. Uh, thanks very much, Carolina, and uh, thank you to the working group for inviting the commission to be part of this panel. Um, it's a really impressive report that the working group has put together um, and we're hoping that we can contribute in some way um, looking at some reflections from the Australian experience. Um, as Carolina mentioned last year, the Commission put together um, a report on the use of force in immigration detention centres in Australia. Um, the Commission has a function of inquiring into complaints about breaches of human rights um, and increasingly what we're trying to do is um, group together complaints that are similar to produce a thematic report. So the Commission um, can produce own motion reports without any complaints coming to it. One example of that is um, a report in 2014 looking at uh, the detention of children in immigration detention centres. Um, but increasingly we're trying to combine those functions together so that individual complaints can also be heard with other complaints of a similar type. Um, and we can draw out consistent themes and recommendations that are similar. Um, so this use of force report was looking at 14 different complaints um, of use of force in immigration detention. Um, it was considering a number of different practices, including the use of handcuffs, um, the use of physical force by guards in immigration detention centres, including um, wrist locks and arm locks, um, and also large scale operations conducted by the emergency response team which is a unit of the private contractor that runs Australia's immigration detention centres. 
In nine of the 14 cases, the Commission found that the manner or the degree of force used was contrary to the, the detainee's human rights. Um, in one case, a detainee was handcuffed over a significant wrist wound. Um, the handcuff um, was left there over the wound for eight and a half hours while the detainee was transferred between different detention centres in Australia. Um, unsurprisingly, that wound became infected over that period of time. Um, in another case, um, four male emergency response team officers wearing riot gear entered the bedroom of a 19-year-old woman early in the morning um, as part of an operation to remove certain families from a particular immigration detention centre. Um, I think this sort of feeds into the concerns about privacy that were raised earlier in the panel. The officers were masked. They refused to allow the young woman to get dressed without at least two of the officers being present. Um, in a third case, as part of that same operation, a mother was separated from her husband and their one month old baby for 32 hours. She was taken to a police station, was not given the ability to contact a lawyer despite requests. Um, and her husband and their sort of newborn baby were taken to an entirely different centre. Um, one theme of the working group's report is that outsourcing public functions to private organisations can create incentives that undermine human rights protections. And we saw that clearly in the Australian context. Um, in Australia, the management of immigration detention centres is outsourced to a private contractor called Serco. Um, the contract contains a number of key performance indicators. Failure to adhere to the requirements of the contract can result in financial penalties. Um, one requirement is to minimise the number of escapes from immigration detention centres. In just under six years from January 2010 through to August 2015, there were 249 escapes from immigration detention centres in Australia. Through its contract with the government, Serco is incentivised to minimise the number of escapes, even if this means adopting more restrictive practices than would otherwise be appropriate. Around a third of all escapes occur in the first month of a person's detention. Serco implemented a measure um, that deemed all detainees to be high risk during their first month of detention, regardless of their actual level of risk. And what this meant was um, that it had impacts on the way in which those detainees were treated. Detainees who are high risk are required to be handcuffed whenever they're outside the detention centre. So that includes transfers between different detention centres or attending um, appointments outside the centre, for example, legal or medical appointments. The result of the policy was the inappropriate use of handcuffs in circumstances where they were not warranted. The Commission was also critical of the way in which um, risk assessments of detainees were carried out by Serco. Serco used a security risk assessment tool um, that was based on a simple count of the number of incidents that a person was involved in while they were in detention, um, with a weighting applied for the type of incident that they were involved in. Um, but like any tool, it relies on the accuracy of the data put into it in order to produce a useful assessment at the end of the day. Um, in one case examined by the Commission, a detainee was refused permission to go on a religious excursion outside of the detention centre. Um, other detainees had been given the opportunity to go on weekly um, excursions to a place of worship. Um, this detainee had his request refused. Um, when those requests were refused, he engaged in a number of peaceful sit-down protests. Um, Serco classed that conduct as a demonstration and he received a high risk rating on his behavioural risk indicator for demonstrations. Um, that in turn was a substantial factor in receiving a high escort risk, which disqualified him from participating in excursions where he would need to be escorted. Um, essentially, this man was disqualified from excursions because he protested peacefully about being disqualified from excursions. Um, this is just one example of the poor outcomes that can result from a mechanical application of a risk assessment tool without sufficient regard to the quality of the data that's being put in. Um, it seems that under the risk assessment tool used by Serco, a person's risk rating cannot be reduced over time, for example, because of good behaviour. 
Um, this means that a person's risk rating is likely to increase the longer that the person remains in immigration detention. And at the moment in Australia, the average length of time um, that someone's kept in immigration detention is 500 days. In some centres, more than 90% of detainees have a high risk rating. And you can see easily how that happens. If someone's there on average for almost two years, um, their risk rating is only gonna go up over time. The Commission agrees with the working group that the privatisation of public functions like immigration detention can easily lead to perverse outcomes that are not consistent with human rights. Um, I've tried to describe just some of the examples coming out of our 2019 report that illustrate that. Um, but if you want some more detail about those, then a copy of that report's available on the Commission's website and I can make it available to Carolina so that participants can um, find a link to it. Thanks very much, Carolina. Thank you very much, Mr. Engerton. And yes, I would invite you to, to include the link in, in our chat box so that participants can um, read and, and see the findings of, of this important report. And let me just also welcome the work of the Australian um, Human Rights Commission in shedding lights to this very worrying developments in the context of immigration detention. And thank you for sharing some of the findings uh, specifically to the impacts of the privatization of detention services. Uh, in this context. And with that, I'll give the floor uh, to Ms. Niam Nibriain, uh, Program Coordinator at the Transnational Institute. Um, and she will be sharing with us some reflections on the role of private military and security companies in the provision of research and technical expertise and in border security technologies and monitoring services. Um, Niam, you have the floor. Perfect. Thank you very much, Carolina. Um, let me start, first of all, by thanking the OHCHR um, and thanking the Working Group on Mercenaries and also Privacy International um, for inviting us at Transnational Institute to join um, this very important and very timely panel. Um, and also to the other panelists for, for sharing this space. I think it's hugely important that we, that we give the time to such an important discussion, um, considering where we are at, I think, on a, on a global level with regard to borders and, and migration and movement. Um, for those who may not have heard of Transnational Institute, maybe just to mention very briefly that we're a research institute based in Amsterdam with over 50, almost 50 years of, of research experience um, and advocating for progressive alternatives on human rights and social justice issues. And as part of the War and Pacification Programme, we've been looking at border wars in the last five or so years and kind of the dynamics that are playing out around border control, border surveillance, um, and in the border question, we've been really looking very much at the role of private corporations um, and, and their role in, in border policies. Um, so I'd like to divide my presentation in three points. So the first is to, to look very briefly at the question of framing and securitization. The second is to briefly mention border policies themselves. And then the third is to kind of mention the role of companies in both the narrative and the policies. Um, so first of all, looking at the question of framing, um, I think what we've been seeing globally is the securitization of border policies, um, whereby states, instead of interpreting a specific issue as a humanitarian situation or an issue that should fit in within a human rights framework, what we've been seeing is that border policies and migration and movement is being perceived as a threat. Um, and so the response to that perceived threats is, is uh, increasingly, uh, coming from national defense, from security, from militarization and from policing. Um, and at least in Europe, we have we've seen that trend, um, I suppose, since the end of the Cold War. So when the Berlin Wall came down, internal borders in Europe started to, to open up, but outwardly Europe started to build a fortress around itself. Um, and I suppose after 9-11, we saw further securitization of borders on a, on a global scale. Um, I suppose as well in Europe after the, the uprisings of the Arab Spring in 2011, we saw also a European policy documents that start to speak of the uprisings and the unrest in the Southern Mediterranean region, region and how this would present a security threat to, to Europe. Um, and so we see that the, the narrative around borders is becoming increasingly securitized. Um, and when we take that and we look at figures on the budgets being spent then on border securitization, um, if I just mention a few figures, 
um, with regard to, for example, uh, the US. Um, so before 9-11, the Immigration Lateralization Service was spending 4.2 billion um, in, in the year 2000 on budget. Um, and by 2018, what had become uh, the Department of Homeland Security, the Customs and Border Protection and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, uh, the budget was 70.6 billion. So we've a 17 fold increase in less than 20 years. And the question, of course, is where is that money going? And the answer is that much of that money is going to private security contractors. Um, when you see a 17 fold increase in the money that's being spent on border policies, you have to really scrutinize, uh, you know, who's, who's on the receiving end of, of that massive profit. And I think that that's also one of the really valuable uh, aspects of this report is that it begins to ask those really important questions. Um, just with regard to border policies, our research has kind of highlighted that the, the border policies can more or less be summarized in policies of containment and deterrence. Um, so we've uh, mentioned a little bit what other panelists mentioned, some uh, aspects of externalization. Um, so we see that uh, Europe, uh, European countries, uh, the US also beginning to externalize their borders for many years, um, whereby they control borders way down into to Africa, so Senegal, uh, having European control of its borders and also as far east as Azerbaijan or with the US controlling Mexico's southern border with Guatemala, for example. Um, and that externalization happens by way of bilateral or multilateral agreements with third countries. Um, and basically the, the idea behind it is to contain people um, so they never make it to the, to, the, to the European borders or to the US border, but they're stuck often in unsafe third countries where they're not afforded uh, international protection. Um, other policies involve building walls, and by walls we mean, I suppose, physical structures, but also maritime structures, um, maritime surveillance, and also virtual walls as well. Um, so our concept of walls is, is not just a concrete wall, but all of the barriers that go up around people on the move, um, and this criminalization of movement that we're seeing with with more and more frequency. And also uh, another policy is, of course, forced returns um, and the forced deportation. And, and Philippe mentioned, I suppose, the, the question of non um and the importance of taking that into account. Um, and I suppose to move on now to the question of, of companies and all of this, where, where do companies fit into, first of all, the securitization narrative and then the policies? Um, I suppose, like I said, there's massive, massive profits being made. Um, in 2018, it was estimated that the, the global border security market was worth 17.5 billion euros. Um, and when you have such a massive for-profit industry and an outsourcing of, of, of services, uh, you have to begin to question the incentives behind such outsourcing. Um, I suppose often we, we perceive the companies to be passive beneficiaries when in fact they're far from passive. Um, and what we see is that the companies involved, the private security companies, are actively involved in framing the narrative, first of all, on the securitization of borders, and then they're actively involved in the implementation of border policies. Um, there's massive lobbying efforts going on in the corridors of power. Um, in Brussels, for example, in Washington, uh, you know, huge lobbying efforts going on to shape the narrative and the security policies around borders. And so we see companies positioning themselves as uh, experts on border security. And so instead of discussing a situation as being a human rights, uh, within a human rights framing, we're discussing something within uh, people on the move within a securitization framework. Um, and because the people who are pushing this narrative are also benefiting from it, you have an upending demand for an ever expanding uh, catalog of, of equipment and, and services for border security and control. Um, on the question of lobbying, we, you know, we have large arms companies um, involved in the European Organization for Security, um, also IT security firms involved in European Biometrics Association. Um, and maybe just to mention the three of the bigger players that we've pulled out in our reports. So Airbus uh, was worth 63.7 uh, billion euros in 2018. Leonardo was worth over 12 billion in 2018. And Talis was worth uh, 15, over 15 billion in 2018. So these are massive, massive profits for arms companies involved in security equipment and services. Um, and it's these companies that are involved in pushing for land 
borders, maritime borders and, and virtual walls and that are lobbying constantly in the corridors of power for the policies to become more and more securitized. Um, and between 2014 and 2019, so over a five year period, the registered lobbying meetings um, were 226 for the three companies I just mentioned. Um, but we imagine that they were also, uh, you know, a range of other encounters where they would have had uh, opportunities to present themselves as experts, uh, you know, at military fairs, security conferences and, and such. Um, and just to quote another figure in 2017, the companies that I mentioned were involved in spending 2.6 million on lobbying alone. So you have a massive uh, you know, investment in lobbying to get access to the people who are making the decisions and then position yourself as an expert to influence that decision. Um, and incidentally, civil society that also should have enough space at the table to, to also lobby around human rights protection is, is being pushed further and further out of security discussions. Um, another company I want to mention is Damon Shipping. Um, so Damon is, is a Dutch company uh, worth 2 billion in 2018. Um, and maybe Damon is one of the, the most uh, it, there's an example that I want to mention about Daman and, and the shipping the industry, but uh, it's one of the major global players in the maritime military and security market. Um, there's been several investigations into allegations of corruption around exports, dubious export deals, um, providing vessels to Frontex, also to NATO, um, and also vessels to Libya, Morocco, Tunisia, Turkey. Um, but in one particular case in 2012, it was documented that Daman made four patrol vessels available to the Libyan Coast Guard. They were sold under a civilian equipment order. Um, and, but as they reached Libya, they actually realized that, the, that they had mounting points where weapons could be mounted. And these ships were used, and it's been documented that they were used in pushing back boats by the Libyan Coast Guard, pushing back boats of refugees and in one particular case up to 30 refugees drowned um, and there's a, uh, in questions hanging over how was it allowed that Damon was able to sell a ship which was clearly for military use but it was sold under civilian contract um, and so you have this kind of dual operation also between equipment that is used in, in one instance as a civilian uh, part of a piece of equipment, but it very quickly becomes military also. Um, and so this kind of wavering over and back between what's civilian and what's, what's military. We see the same thing happening also with aircraft, with helicopters, um, with drones and such. Um, I'm not sure I'm doing on time, but uh, if I'm going over, you can uh, interrupt me, Carolina. Um, I want to mention also Israeli arms just companies. Quick, quickly um, wrap up. That would be that would be ideal. Yep. So just to mention um, very quickly, the Israeli ar army companies that shamelessly promote themselves as being battlefield proven, um, where they're testing their wall-related surveillance on captive population and then marketing that to the U.S market also to the European market um, and then there's also the question of surveillance companies which I'll, I won't go into because I think it was already covered by Ilya um, but there's massive profits being made by surveillance companies and, and huge questions hanging over um, uh, the, the question of data um, and also maybe just to mention that these companies are involved uh, they benefit from, from people being on the move and securitizing borders, but it's the same arms companies that are also involved in destabilizing the regions that these people are fleeing from. So they're selling the arms to destabilizing regions through conflict, and then they're also benefiting a second time around from the people fleeing those recent regions and securitizing the borders. Um, other questions that I was going to mention, but I'm, I'm out of time, were around campaign contributions, so companies paying for, for politicians to get into power through campaigns and then receiving contracts in return. Um, the concept of resolving doors and, and people going in and out of government and into private companies. Um, and, and I suppose just to, to finish, the, I think the, the real value of this report is that it, it's exposing all of these darker corners of border policies, which are, are very often kind of uh, that, that we cast a blind eye to or that we're not so much aware of the role that companies actually have in shaping the policies, in rolling them out and then reaping massive, massive benefits and making a business opportunity for what is a, a global humanitarian and, and political catastrophe. So we very much welcome the report um, and the kind of scrutiny that's being put on, on these massive global players.
Um, and sorry if I went over time, it's a, such a huge question, um, but I'll, I'll put some links in the chat to some of the reports where people can, can look for more information. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nam. And yes, please do include the links and, and I hope maybe we can come back to some of these points as uh, the participants raise questions. I would invite them before uh, give the, the floor to the last distinguished speaker to indicate in the chat box whether they would like to raise a question so that we can unmute um, their, their speakers and allow them to raise the questions. But thank you for this very important reflections on the securitization of borders and this very important and, and worrying elements about uh, financial planning, spending and profit. And also this important point that you made that we haven't really covered that much about narratives and how these actors are really framing the narratives on, on migrants and migration. I will now uh, give the floor last but not least to Dr. Daria Daviti, senior lecturer, lecturer in the Department of Law at the Lund University who will be sharing some reflections on the challenges and opportunities foreseen in the implementation recommendations outlined in the working report. Uh, thank you, and Dr. Deviti, you have the floor. Thank you, Carolina. And um, so let me express my thanks to the UN Working Group for inviting me and to the Working Group and Privacy International for organizing this. So yes, I will uh, try to be brief and um, because I think it's, it would be good to have a discussion afterwards. And what I thought I would do as I have to, um, the privilege of, of concluding this um, great panel is to perhaps reflect a little bit on, on how already the environment is changing around us. Because now that we have this um, report that is really important and these very, very welcome recommendations, it's up to us really as civil society to continue. Uh, the monitoring and to somehow do our best to push for for implementation. So what we see now, it's it's already a change in landscape. From uh, although it's been only a few months since since the report and it's just been presented. Um, in terms of both political and policy um, situation, so we have uh, of course, as we all know, a looming uh, U.S. election, and then we have a financial crisis coming from COVID nineteen. Um, that is looming or in some ways and in many countries is already there, um, which in a way risks seeing states doubling down on border control as um, going back to the narrative that Niamh was talking about, um, refugees and migrants are perceived even more as a, as a security threat in terms of like economic and financial security. And they're, they're perceived and portrayed as such, including by, by the companies themselves. Um, but importantly, there is also a new pact on asylum proposed by the European Union. And I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes on, on this because really it reflects what's happening already in Australia, as the colleagues from, from the Commission uh, pointed out, and in the US, but it's potentially creating a much more dangerous situation here also in Europe. So the, the proposed pact is important to say there is still a proposal and, um, and so there is still time for, for maneuvering there. Um, focuses on um, a, a lot on pre-screening at the border. Pre-screening at the border meaning outside um, of the European border. So increasingly in, in countries bordering, bordering Europe, bordering the EU. And a pre-screening that, um, as uh, the report itself is pointing out, but as also some of the colleagues in the panel have pointed out, might entail increasing uh, detention and might also in, entail an increase in participation by private military and security company in the screening that itself, but also in the detention of people outside of the, of the EU board. Um, there is also no ban on, uh, on um, search and rescue NGO criminalization in the, in the pact. There is no mention of it, which means that there is still a risk that this will continue with the consequences that we know this will have at sea. There is an emphasis on more cooperation uh, with the third countries, um, increasingly informal cooperation, but also, uh, as we know, cooperation that um, entails a doubling down on, uh, on border control also outside of the European Union. And increasingly, I would like to say also not only a matter of externalization, but also very much maybe we should look at it as a matter of containment, of making sure really that refugees never reaches the, uh, the global north. Um, and also within the pact, there is a possibility for EU member states to buy um, 
the responsibility for deportations so or so-called returns if member states are not willing to offer relocation or resettlement and this has been already denounced by many civil society organizations as highly problematic because it, it seems to show that solidarity can be uh, within the EU context can be shown through um, deportations if you're not willing to resettle or relocate. So, of course, this, as I said, creates challenges in terms of detention, including of children. There is an emphasis on detention in children, despite the prohibition that the various um, um, special procedure I have I've highlighted. Um, more risks of deportations and removal, risk of increased criminalization and penalization, but also importantly, all of this would create more business opportunities um, for private national security company and outsourcing to them to avoid state responsibility. Because I think something that the report makes very clear and that I think it's important to point out here is that states are actually, because we always rely on the states when it comes to recommendation, because of course the states are the primary duty bearers when we deal with non-state actors. But the issue is that states are purposely deciding to outsource because that's their attempt to, to avoid state responsibility, including in non-traditional services. So we see food distribution, access to health, and as I said, refugee uh, pre-screening outside of the border. So when I talk about avoiding state responsibility, of course, this is, this is because of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction legally remaining the major obstacles when PMC are operating transnationally. And uh, so we all know the constraints in strategic litigation and litigation altogether in ascertaining state responsibility when, uh, when the abuse is caused by a non-state actor. Since as we know, some ter territorial and personal control often do not fully reflect the reality on the ground. So at the moment in front of the European Court of Human Rights, there is a pending case that is testing a functional approach to jurisdiction. So that would be an additional approach to jurisdiction. But this is still an interstate cooperation between Italy and Libya. So this is the pending case of SS and Libya where the functional approach is being tested. And so the possibility might be there, um, I think, and this is part of the work that also some of our students are doing on testing whether the functional approach could also be applied to non-state actors such as private military and security companies. Um, also, one thing that I would like to mention is um, the appearance of um, other private corporate actors, such as, for instance, investors, and the fact that the, the global compacts, so on refugees and on migrants, are um, increasingly calling on, uh, on investors to fund responses to refugees and migrants. And, and so the whole host of issues that this, that this could, um, could create, not least because of the way in which states and non-state actors are actually um, increasing cooperation in terms of, um, of through development aid and through other forms of, of funding. Um, so reflecting on, so these are obviously all the challenges, right? And so reflecting on the, on the possibilities and the opportunities, it's, it's a little bit difficult um, in this type of context. However, I still think that it's up to us to take this opportunity now to increase monitoring and uh, not to lower the guard at this moment when we have a very important report that at least acknowledges the, the entity and the, like in a UN report, the entity and the magnitude of, of the issue. And so we also see in the business and human rights context and in the work of other special procedure, which I think it's really important uh, to, to look at because, and, and we have uh, Felipe here as one of the other special procedures, to see that there is at the moment an overall push for regulations. And, and so it's up to us also to make sure that although this might take long, this could be an opportunity for more detailed and really focused regulations. And of course, the landscape is changing very rapidly, but our job is to keep abreast and, and in a way rather than in human rights, we often do uh, firefighting and damage control. So it's important, I think, to kind of try and be a step ahead and already um, see at the horizon the changes as they're, as they're happening so that we can try and prevent harm when we can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Daviti. This, this overview of, of possible challenges and opportunities to implement the recommendations of the working group. Very important points as regards the impact on migration and asylum uh, that has been presented. Avenues, for example, in strategic litigation, very interesting, and, and also um, how to explore uh, regulations on, on this area that while there have been some developments, 
they have not really addressed or still find a number of gaps in terms of addressing uh, issues regarding migration governance. Um, with that, I will then invite, and thanks also to all the speakers that have shared some of the links to the reports um, and uh, to information in the chat box. I would like to invite our participants to flag whether they have any questions by uh, indicating in the chat box that they would like to take the floor. I see that we have one of our participants, um, Chloe, uh, have asked a question. Uh, maybe we can unmute Chloe for her to, to share with us the question. Chloe, would you like to take the floor? I wonder whether your mic is not working. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Apologies. Um, two weeks ago, the EU announced its new pact on migration and asylum. This new pact clearly divorces the discussion of irregular migration to that of legal migration. Despite the increase of global supply chain disruptions and labor shortages across Europe caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, Europe has made no commitment to liberalize migration. Can increasing legal migration pathways address irregular migration? It seems there is an opportunity to face this problem of labor shortages head on with solidifying legal migration pathways rather than criminalizing illegal migrant workers. Thank you very much, Zoe. Um, maybe I would like to take a couple of questions before going back to the speakers. Um, I, I don't see any hands being raised on the platform or the chat box. Just a final call for, for participants. We have 60 participants with us. Um, if there's anyone that would like to ask a question or make a reflection. All right. Um, I believe we do have a question from Ana Gonzalez. Hi. Hi. Yes, Hi. please, Ana. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Uh, well, um, I'm from uh, Fundación for, por Causa. It's a Spanish foundation that works uh, while well, trying to communicate uh, migration from journalism and social research. And we have been working on uh, migration control. Uh, this uh, We have published a second report uh, this month of July. And we try, uh, we are focused only in the south border in uh, in spanish south border sorry not in uh, in the rest of uh, uh, of europe well uh, my questions because we were uh, really uh, waiting for this uh, new pact on uh, migration from the european union and we saw that this consolidated all these uh, well the the usual patterns of uh, fortification of frontiers and uh, and externalization and uh, well my questions um are um how could we uh, change these dynamics no uh, mainly uh, like so dangerous uh, intermediates like frontex uh, dealing directly with the uh, human rights and uh, between uh, member states and people i mean uh, uh, human beings also i would like to to uh, underline that there is no any mention in the text of the of the new pact about the global compacts which uh, it's really shocking, not even a mention. And well, uh, I would like to uh, to know uh, your your feedback from this uh, EU uh, new or fresh uh, pact. Thank you. Uh, 
Very well, thank you very much, Anna. Um, and while we are not uh, to ask a question, I will also share with the panelists a question from uh, Jamie. Um, he's asking the panelists uh, different roles. They see different, the panelists see different roles for military contractors versus security companies. That is a question from Jamie. And then uh, Adriana, uh, would you like to raise your question if you are now unmuted? Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for making this conference public and accessible. It is an honor for a student like me to be able to listen to such a prestigious panel. Uh, my question regards um, state responsibility. Uh, I was wondering if Professor Daviti could um, better explain the functional approach. Uh, I understand how um, it is possible to see a functional approach between Italy and Libya. It is not clear to me, however, how uh, this functional approach can be applied to private military and security companies. Uh, also, another question that I have uh, regards regulation of private military and security companies by part of states. Um, in compliance with their due diligence obligations. And I was wondering if the panelists see as uh, main duty bearers, uh, the contracting states or the home states of the private military and security companies. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Adrian. And then I, I would then go back to our panelists and we'll invite them to share just briefly in a couple of minutes because we're running out of time, a few reflections on the questions raised. And we will go in reverse order, starting with Dr. Daviti. Okay, right. Um, so, Carolina, you want me to answer the last question, right? On, on whichever question you would prefer okay, to raise. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief and, and maybe, so I will start with the last one, Adriana, and, and you're welcome to send me an email to go into more details. Otherwise, I think I will bore everybody on state responsibility. Um, so just briefly, the functional approach, whether, first of all, whether it will be accept, as accepted, as you know, by the European Court of Human Rights remains to be seen. Um, but the functional approach, I, I, I don't know whether you know the details of, of how SS has been, has been put forward, but um, also by other scholar has been suggested that um, on top of territorial control and control over, over a person, uh, so individual control, then um, there is the issue of control over a situation. So the functional approach would be potentially I'm not saying that this is possible and this would be successful, transferable on also on the relation to the relationship between the state and uh, the non-state actor um, by trying to prove control over, over a certain specific situation. Um, however, of course, you know, for those who are interested in international law, our CWA, the draft articles on state responsibility stands in the way. And, um, and also, of course, regional, regional law is not always the best to be able to do this. So this is in a nutshell. Um, and, and on your question of whether regulation to home states and host states, most of my work, it's um, supporting the fact that the, the, there is actually an obligation uh, that comes from due diligence in international law on home states to regulate the activities of their companies when they are operating transnationally. Um, on non-legal stuff, that may, may still be legal, Zoe, you were asking about legal pathways and of course legal pathways remains very, very important and, uh, and a lot of scholars and civil society actors are working on the possibility of extending legal pathways. We go back to what I was saying at the beginning, the objective is not opening the borders, but is actually ensuring uh, externalization and containment. And that's not only in Europe, that's across, uh, I would say across the global north. So legal pathways are not, and, and of course with the, with, the, with the EU pact being proposed, um, the fact that you can actually purchase and buy out your responsibility to resettle um, or relocate by uh, providing deportations or so-called returns is obviously very problematic. And I think, of course, then, Anna, the problem of fast tracking, you call it triple, triple border control, that's very problematic because in itself creates, and I, I think the other panelists would agree, a business opportunity because fast tracking means that it has to be done 
fast, not necessarily according to due process, and not necessarily you will be able to identify people who, who are um, particularly at risk, for instance, people who are traumatized and by default will need time in order to come out. Fast tracking in, in states, uh, the termination procedures have been proven to be very, very detrimental to the rights of um, people on the move. On the, and, and I'll leave it there, on the different roles for military contractors and security companies, I think probably the, the working group members are better placed than me, but I would say that unfortunately there is a very, there's a lot of conflation between the two. And of course, in an ideal world, we would like to, to have silos compartment and, and to see that the roles are completely different. But I think um, what all the panelists here um, indicated and also the report indicates is that there is really like uh, a multi-sectorial and multi-layered um, work uh, done by private military and security companies that really diversifies in very different sectors, both military and non-military. And I will leave it there. Thank you, uh, Dr. Daviti. I, I will then give the floor to uh, Ms. Nibriain, but before that we have to add an, an additional question to those uh, four previously raised um, uh, from Laurel asking, how would you like to see from the Human Rights Council in response to this specific issue and the lack of accountability for the violation of human rights of migrants uh, being addressed by the Human Rights Council uh, more broadly? What steps should uh, the Human Rights Council be taking? Um, with that, um, and any reflections on these or, or any other questions, uh, Niam, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I probably won't have time to address every aspect of the questions, but maybe just three things that I wanted to jump in on. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I agree with what Daria said on the military contractors versus security companies. I think that at the end of the day, um, the, it seems that the, the, the end goal that these uh, contractors are working for, be it military or security, is the, the policies which are deterrence and containment. And so I think, like my example about the ship that's sold in a civilian capacity and then it's got a weapons pointer mounted on it, something can very easily shift from being military to security and over and back. So I think that if it's got the same end, then I really, yeah, it's very hard to distinguish between the two. And I think that we should scrutinize both uh, both sectors as, as, as problematic within the border security industrial complex. Um, then on the question of migrant workers and whether we should legalize, uh, you know, increase legalized pathways for migrant workers, um, there's already a number of programs in place where migrant workers can travel, for example, from Morocco to the south of Spain, where they're involved in fruit picking and strawberries. Um, and there's huge, huge human rights violations around um, migrant workers that are moving legally into Europe to participate in seasonal work and then going back to the north of Africa. I think that if we want to address the situation of legalized pathways, we need to address, first of all, the root causes of why people are fleeing in the first place. And I think one of the questions we didn't get into so much today is the, the, the multilateral agreements that are being made between Europe and third countries, often around free trade agreements, for example, which are beneficial for uh, Europe and there's a carrot and stick approach and they're not so beneficial perhaps for African for African neighbors um, and if we're going to get into the question of looking at migrant workers and, and simply just advocate for opening up uh, legal pathways we need to really delve into why people are moving in the first place um, and the whole and, and all that is capitalism and, the, and neoliberalism but I don't think we have time to get into that when we're we've only six minutes left but it's a huge question that I think does um, merit further discussion and then finally on the on the EU new pact it's uh, doubling down on the kinds of policies that are already hugely detrimental and devastating for people who are on the move um, it's abs it's shambolic that they that they consider that they can like uh, Daria said also they can buy out people um, you know, they can, instead of uh, collectively uh, responding to their obligation to seek, to provide the conditions where people can seek asylum, they can actually pay to have these people returned. Um, and we're, we're reaching a new low in Europe uh, at, at, with regard to, to border policies with what's been rolled out in, in this new pact. I think with that, I'll finish up because there's a few other speakers. So thank you very much. And thanks to you. And yes, uh, broad questions to hopefully continue following up on as we look at the at the follow up of the recommendations of this report. Uh, um, Mr. Edgerton, any any reflections on, on these broad questions from the Australian Human Rights Commission? Uh, 
I know we're low, low on time, so I'll just make one point. Um, picking up on the jurisdictional question that was asked about home states versus contracting states, um, in the Australian context, we've managed to add an extra wrinkle to that by um, using third countries to process refugees. So Australia has had a practice of sending refugees to Nauru and to Papua New Guinea, setting up detention centres in those environments and then contracting detention managers to manage those um, foreign centres. And the way in which the Australian Human Rights Commission has analysed that has been, I mean, the, the same way that the um, Special Rapporteur described earlier today in this panel, um, focusing on state responsibility. The fact that the asylum seekers have come to Australia first and claimed asylum here doesn't mean that Australia can um, get rid of its own responsibility to those asylum seekers by moving them to a third country. Um, and we've looked at who is effectively in control of those detention centres. And a lot of that does involve looking at the contracts with um, third parties who are managing those detention centres, who has the day-to-day -day responsibility for directing their operations. Um, and in a report that we published last year, dealing specifically with the Nauru situation, which is where families and single women were being sent, um, we came to the clear conclusion that it was Australia that had effective control. It was managing the centre and ultimately it was responsible for the conditions within that centre. Thank you very much, Graham. And if you don't mind sharing that, uh, the link to that uh, last report that you just mentioned on the chat box, that would be great. Happy to do uh, that. Special Rapporteur, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you for the questions from the public. I would like to, to make a short comment about the issue of uh, uh, regular pathways and, and regularizations of those uh, who are already in the country of destination. Um, I think that the, the global compact on migration um, really on this matter refers uh, uh, almost exclusively on uh, uh, regular pathways. Uh, and not explicitly or not in a relevant manner about regularization of those who are already in the country of destination. I am uh, a member of the steering committee of the Trust Fund um, for the implementation of the Global Compact on Migration. And uh, we have uh, uh, allocated funds for a number of projects. Uh, um, and quite a few of them uh, uh, are related to the issue of uh, regular pathways. However, due to the pandemic, uh, these projects uh, have not uh, yet started. In any event, these are pilot projects. Uh, so the idea would be that uh, this become a, a more constant feature. Now, on the issue of uh, regularization, um, the, 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 the compact doesn't address this uh, issue uh, significantly. And I think it's a key factor as well, uh, a, a key decision that has to be made. Uh, my mandate and the Committee of Migrant Workers last May, last May issued a joint guidance note to states about the pandemic and uh, migration. And one of the points that uh, we stressed was the need to conduct uh, wide processes of regularization uh, during the current pandemic, so as to ensure the enjoyment of human rights uh, by all migrants uh, in, in those countries. And, uh, and I think that uh, clearly over the last few years, uh, uh, regularizations uh, have become uh, more and more exceptional. And uh, although I wouldn't say that there is a, a general absolute obligation on the part of states of uh, regularizing everybody, each and every person living uh, who is a foreigner in that country, when you see that uh, many people, uh, due to the regular situation, the regular status, uh, are really in a, uh, are seen very gravely affected in their human rights, there is then an obligation on the state to conduct the, the, the regularization process as, a, as an effective remedy. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe, uh, and then invite our participants to join us only for a few more minutes. Uh, we're running a little bit late. Um, but uh, we want to give the, the floor then to our uh, co-host of, of the event today, uh, Dr. Setsitsa, before also giving the floor to the, the chair rapporteur and any other working group members of the, of the working group on the use of mercenaries. Uh, Dr. Setsitsa. Thank you very much and thank everyone for uh, the uh, contribution. So, uh, it's, uh, I'm going to be very brief, uh, trying um, to cover 
a bit some of the questions with regard to the pact, uh, as it was already mentioned, uh, us reading it, we were as disappointed as one can be uh, with op the, the pact basically opens uh, the door to increasingly even more intrusive tools of surveillance using new technologies and giving even more power to Frontex to do so. And uh, that doesn't look very promising on how things will go. And uh, on who bears the responsibility, uh, totally agree with what was said on the responsibility that companies need to hold and often how the lines between military and security sector gets blurred and who owns which company is often quite revealing on how much all these are merged but also for us, what we've been observing as well is the, the complete lack of responsibility of, of countries financing a lot of these new surveillance measures. I've mentioned uh, briefly in my presentation about the EU Trust Fund for Africa and the lack of impact assessments and legal frameworks in the countries where new databases have been implemented as part of the managing migration policy. And as far as we know, and been in touch with the new institutions on their side they consider they bear no responsibility on how these databases are introduced in the countries and this is the responsibility of the country within which uh, this measure is implemented uh, so uh, i think this is somewhere also we need to look um, for pointing uh, to the direction that uh, they hold a responsibility as well to what they finance and how Thank you very much again. Thanks to you. And then uh, last but not least, for, for a few reflections, but also closing remarks from the Chair Rapporteur and any other member of the working group on the use of mercenaries that would like to uh, make a, a few last remarks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think just two quick um, reflections. The first um, is for us as members of the, the, the working group on machineries, we recognize the power of our collective voice uh, to speak on these issues. And that is the only way we can really draw attention to the opacity and impunity that defines the activities of private military and security companies in the context of border, uh, the, the, I mean, the detention and the border, border management. When it, when it comes to my, my migrants, as we, as we see. And that is why a panel of this nature is quite important, because it helps us understand the perspectives that each organization, each actor is bringing to the table, and how we can, on the basis of such perspectives, work together and amplify our voices in engaging states, as well as other multilateral uh, institutions that are looking at these issues, and in particular, the state themselves. The second reflection, it's the way and manner accountability and transparency is dealt with in the context of what the working group sees as the fact that in the absence of a legally binding instrument that provides for clarity around how accountability and transparency in the context of the activities of private military and security companies will be, will, will, be, will be dealt with, both in terms of the issues we are discussing today and several other areas that these entities are active. If we are not able to push for such, um, there is a limit to what we can do when it comes to dealing with accountability and transparency. And for the working group, that has been a major issue. And as we think through this conversation and the way forward, in, 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 in moving or engagement or advocacy with actors, this is also one area that we think we can push and get the Human Rights Council, uh, the General Assembly, and uh, every other uh, multilateral institution that we know is very important uh, for us on this to move on. I think so far these are the two points I'm making because many of those other issues that we have raised uh, were captured by other panelists. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Chair Aporto. I understand maybe some of the other working group members would like to take uh, the floor for some, some final, final words. Yes, thank you, yes. Carolina. Sarah McLeod, I'm uh, a member of the, the, the working group on the use of mercenaries and the WIOG uh, person on the, the, the working group. And I've been asked just to, to say a couple of concluding uh, words. I will try to be very brief. We're all busy people. Um, let me just, before I make my concluding remarks, just come back to this issue of definitions. Um, and as several speakers have said, the issue of definitions is very problematic. But we are very careful in our report, in our definition section in the, the report, to highlight the, 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 the value of um, defining uh, these actors by the services that they provide, not by how they self-identify. Um, and so, in particularly in relation to uh, migration, um, we can see that um, a variety of other actors who would not you know, fit, fit normally within a definition of a private military security company or a private military company or a private security company, but they do provide security related services. And we've heard from some of the speakers, we've heard about air, airlines, for example, we've heard about defense companies, we've heard about information and technology companies. So for the, from the working group's perspective, um, we, we consistently use a, a, a definition that relies on the, the provision of services, not on the, the label or the self-identification of the, the company. We find that to be an unhelpful um, distinction. Um, just a couple of concluding uh, remarks. It seems to me that all of the speakers have been talking about what I see, and I think the working group would see as um, an overarching con conceptual ob obstacle. And that is the, this, this dichotomy between securitization, one hand in that narrative, and a human rights narrative on, on the other. And that the securitization narrative is decentralizing, uh, decentering and marginalizing migrants in, in a variety of very serious um, uh, ways. Um, we've also heard uh, from speakers talking about how, um, in addition to the, the, the you know, traditional um, human rights violations, in, in, you know, such as um, issues around the, the, the use of force and the right to life and the freedom from inhuman and degrading treatment, we're seeing with the new technologies the challenges um, uh, that uh, private security companies and states are facing in, in uh, observing their human rights um, ob obligations. And that this is being exacerbated by um, the, the, the increasing um, tendency to head towards externalization of, of, of uh, migration uh, policies. Um, and ultimately what we're seeing with all of these things taken together, we're seeing that these shifts, these, this, this securitization narrative, the decentering of migrants is benefiting the private security sector. They're, pr they're, they're profiting from the securitization and they're not being incentivized to comply with, uh, with human rights. So the working group is very grateful for everyone's participation today, whether you were speaking or whether you, you were listening. We regard this report as a starting point, not an end point. And we definitely would uh, very much welcome your continued engagement with, with the working group. We would be very interested to receive uh, information from you, from the NGO civil society perspective, that might enable us to proceed with uh, communications, allegation letters to states and to the private sector in relation to human rights violations associated with our, uh, with our mandate. Um, so thank you again, uh, and uh, we, we, we wish you all very well, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you very much, Ms. McLeod. And just with that, thank, give a, a big thanks and a congratulations to, to you and all working group members for this very important report to Privacy International as the co-host of the event, for, to all the speakers or panelists joining us today and all the participants who um, we also invite uh, to join the call from the working group members to follow up on the recommendations of the report and to mention that the event uh, that we had today will be uploaded on the platform of Privacy International later today. And thank you very much to you all. You know, uh, a good end of the day. <laughs>